Well, hello to all of you who are watching today, whether you're watching live or that you're watching on demand sometime this week. We are so glad that you're with us uh, whenever and however you're watching this. And I want to welcome you uh, to week number three of a series we're calling As Told by Jesus, where what we're doing is we're looking into the parables that Jesus taught. And if you missed the last couple weeks, uh, or if you're brand new uh, to us, here's what a parable is. A parable is just, an, it's like an earthly story. It's like a relatable story that connects to, to an actual truth. It's just a made up story uh, that, that teachers use to connect to an actual truth. Jesus loved teaching parables. He taught a lot of parables. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you'll see a lot of parables in there. Uh, and he loved teaching parables when it came to faith and God and the kingdom of God and all those things. And because he, he liked liked tying in an earthly story that people can relate to to an actual heavenly truth uh, that sometimes was a little complicated for us to understand. And uh, so today we're going to move to the next pair. We're going to get on to the next one. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those uh, and you can open those up to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Jesus is going to tell us uh, a parable here about two guys, a made up story about two guys. And this is one of my favorite parables, actually. There's over 30 parables that Jesus taught. This is one of my favorites. And uh, it's one of my favorites because because for me, this is a, a, a parable that God uses in my life. He, he, he uses it to remind me over and over again about a few of the temptations that I have when it comes to my faith and, and maybe how I see people. Uh, and, and why we're going to talk about it today is because um, this parable is really important. This is an important parable for us as a church, for really any church out there, because even churches too sometimes need to look at how we uh, act with people and what we do and, and when it comes to people. Because here's the deal, gang. Uh, when it does come to people, uh, I'm sure we we've all felt this uh, a time or two in our lives. I, I think we've all had a feeling uh, where we felt like we were looked down on, right? Where we were judged or, or we do, like we're in a situation where people look at us and we just feel like we don't uh, belong at all. Uh, and I'm sure that we've all felt like that. You had that eyes, the, the eyes on you and all that stuff. And uh, I, I'm sure we've been there. You know, right now, uh, probably the best way to describe that is kind of where we are with masks right now, right? Like I think that uh, depending on where you're at, I think there's a lot of mask shaming uh, going on right now. Uh, it's either you didn't get your mask on t soon enough, right? And so you get kind of looked at weird. You get, you know, you get these eyes on you. Or, or actually there are some places that you get kind of mask shamed if you're even wearing uh, a mask. So it's almost like you just get this feel, you get this feeling like you don't belong or that you're, you're sticking out or something like that. Politically, this is really bad, isn't it? Right? Like, because man, people on the left are this and, and people on the right are that. And how can you be in this party? And we look down, don't we? We look down often on people who don't even see things the same way that we see. We don't, we just look down on them. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, you ever been in a restaurant where uh, you feel like you have to uh, like understand a secret language to even order off the menu? Isn't that true some places that you've been? Uh, a few years ago, I did a wedding for some friends of mine in the Outer Banks and it was actually during the off season and so we went there and being in a place uh, where it's like heavily trafficked, a tourist place, it's really different being there in the off season when the locals kind of, you know, get their place back, right? And so one morning we woke up there and we decided to go get some coffee. Just a group of us said, let's go get a coffee and so we went into the uh, coastal town there and, and we, we found this coffee shop and it wasn't like a mainstream coffee shop that you would think, you know, it was, a, it was just kind of a local place. It looked really nice from the outside and, and so we got out and we all started to walk inside and the second like we walked in the second that door opened man it was like you could feel all the eyes on you as the door started to close slowly right and it's like man you just you just felt this like oh man we don't something's not good here they're looking at us weird and and like we couldn't do anything uh to actually make us even look remotely close to fitting in there my cargo shorts did not help me one bit at all right and i swear the music that was playing when we were there was you shouldn't be here i swear that's what we heard uh, but what was great about this uh, was our friend Rick now Rick uh, is the kind of guy where like he just doesn't have the same sort of like uh, indicators that a lot of people have when it comes to feeling uncomfortable we just he just lacked that indicator okay which actually made Rick really great and so Rick comes in just laughing and belly laughing about all kinds of stuff I mean he walked in like we were at his house getting a cup of coffee uh, which made everybody even more upset that we were there because no no we didn't leave uh, we stayed there we ordered uh, coffee and all that stuff and, and so we got there everybody 
Faith Lutheran Center. And there's Rick uh, acting like we're at the IHOP waiting on pancakes, you know, just having a great time, just completely oblivious uh, to the whole situation, right? But, but for the rest of us, maybe not Rick, uh, but for the rest of us, man, we've all felt this once uh, or twice in our lives, being in a place where people make you feel like you don't belong, right? Or this, that there's this contempt, like this contempt on us. And it's not a good feeling. It's not a feeling that we like to have. And it happens a lot. And here's the thing, gang, it happens a lot in churches. And Jesus, he felt this too. And I think that's why he gave us this parable because he wanted to address a few things uh, to the church and to us in this parable. So we're gonna pick this up. We're gonna just read what he says. Uh, We're gonna be in Luke 18. We're gonna pick this up in verse nine. And here's what he says. He's gonna talk about these two guys. And here's what he says. I love how he starts this out because it says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And here's what he says. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. So there are the two guys uh, that he brings up. So, so one of these guys uh, is a Pharisee, right? Now, if you don't know much about the Pharisee, they were the religious good guys uh, back then. They were the rule followers. They were good guys. I think Pharisees a lot of times get a bum rap, uh, but they were actually really, really good guys. We're gonna look into a few things uh, that he did wrong in a second, but a Pharisee was generally a really good member of society, They had good jobs. They worked jobs. They were devoted to their spiritual uh, life. They were devoted to their teacher. They they were very religious, very moral. They they did the right thing. They did the right thing more often uh, than not. So that was the Pharisee. And then there's the tax collector. That's the second guy. And and what we need to know about the tax collector is that this was the most hated profession in all of Israel. And here's why, here's why. Israel at that time uh, was an occupied territory by Rome. And what Rome did, Rome did a lot of things to kind of control the territory. And one of the things they did was they imposed taxes on people. So they would kind of oppress them by collecting money. And how they actually controlled that is they would actually sell franchises to people who were Israelites uh, to actually denounce Judaism, become tax collectors, denounce Judaism, and then become Roman citizens. And then they would start to collect taxes from their own people. And not only that, what they would do is they would, again, they would then overtax. They would be kind of corrupt in that. They would overtax so that they could send the money that they needed to Rome, and then they could keep money uh, for themselves as well. But they, and it was okay. They got by with it because they were protected by the Romans uh, who actually controlled and occupied that territory. So so they were legally extorting money from their own people. So so they were kind of hated. Uh, They they actually were kind of hated. They were actually in their own class. They were completely in their own class. In fact, if you read a lot of the stories about Jesus, what you'll see a lot of time is when he was around some people, sometimes you'll come across it says he was with sinners and tax collectors. Now, now you wonder like, why would they do that? Why would they separate that out? And and here's why, because even sinners didn't want to be associated with tax collectors. I just think that's hilarious because there's even an us and them with sinners because people are like, oh man, you're a sinner. But they're like, yeah, at least I'm not a tax collector. They're like, yeah, yeah, you got a point. I mean, that's just, that's how they were. That's where they were, okay? So that's where, those are the two people. We got the Pharisee, we got the good guy, we got the tax collector coming in. And here's what happens in verse 11. It says, the Pharisee, standing by himself prayed thus he said God I thank you that I'm not like the other men extortioners unjust adulterers or even like this tax collector I fast twice a week I give tithes of all that I get and so we see this Pharisee right he's coming and and to the temple to pray and 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 I think here's what Jesus wants us to know so as we look at this we're going to look at what I think Jesus wants us to know about this guy uh, to be clued in on a few things one thing that I noticed is that he comes in and he stands by himself Jesus said he stood by himself which I think means that the Pharisee when he comes I think he was being genuine I don't think that he was trying to make a show or anything of that he stood by himself he was being on his own he 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 wasn't trying to impress people Uh, and so that's one thing and then it says he starts praying okay Uh, and, and here's what I get uh, from Jesus with this guy I see a dude who says God thank you that I'm not a bad guy thanks so much that I'm not a bad guy, right? I mean, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. Look look back at what he actually says. He says, he, he's not saying, God, I'm great. Uh, he's not saying that, but he's genuinely saying, man, like, thanks, thanks. And, and I mean, he takes a shot at the tax collector, uh, but, but other than that, he gets into what he does right. He gets, he looks, he's like, look at what I do. I do these good things and, and, and nothing bad. I, I tithe, I fast, I give money. I do all these great things. And really, honestly, gang, I don't know how far off so many of us are in our own prayers, really, when we look at God and we're trying to like tell God all these things about us I'm just saying like we're probably not far 
off when we look at our own prayers. So not bad stuff, just, just good stuff he's doing. He's working on being a good person. Okay, now first guy, first prayer. Let's go to the second guy, second prayer. It says, but the tax collector standing far off, Jesus says, will not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. All right, so, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look at the differences that Jesus really uh, contrasts here with these two people. I think he really wants us to see this. And so a couple differences. First difference that I see is, is that the, instead of, of what we see in the Pharisee, the, the tax collector stands far off. He says, man, he's so far off. He's like at the edge of the room, eyes down. He came and looked to heaven. And, and again, I think it's, it's that us and them, he probably knows that he already feels like he doesn't belong, but it's a picture you could see of him versus the other guy. And here's the other thing that I actually, See, the other thing we have to see is he had nothing to say thanks about to God. Like not one thing to look at to say thanks. It's crazy. He had nothing good to offer God at all. And he knew a dark cloud of those things going on in his life, but nothing good. Like that's what you got to think. Like there's nothing you got. Because here's the thing, like I'm sure there are a lot of us, I, I know I can look at it, there are a lot of us could relate to some of that stuff. Where I mean, there's, there's a lot we could look at in our lives where we have guilt or maybe even shame. There's that one time, there's that one lie, there's that one thing that we did, but at least we have something to say that was good, something to actually say, man, at least I got that in my life, but nothing, nothing. And, I, and here's what I think, this is what I think, gang. I think he had something good in his life. I think he had something going on, but he just, he wasn't going there. He just wasn't going there. He looks past anything to validate himself and just says, man, have mercy on me. Have God, I, I need your, I see you, I see me. I'm not even gonna try and justify this life. I'm not even gonna try to do that. Two men, two prayers. Let's see the outcome because uh, it's not so much what we've seen so far as why Jesus is saying it's what we need to get. Let's look at the outcome because uh, this is the whole point of why we're talking about this in verse 14. Here's what Jesus says. He goes, I'll tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified. So the tax collector this guy, Jesus says, is the one who's justified. And here's what justified means. Justified means just what it sounds like. It's to be just. It's to be made right, to have a right standing in front of a judge, before the judge. So what this guy, what Jesus is saying this guy was, is that he came in however he came in, but he walked away guiltless and approved, approved by God. Not condemned, but with right standing. And what we do, here's what we do, gang. What we do is we look at that and we say, man, that's awesome. Like, I was pulling for him. I'm so glad. I'm so happy for that guy. Uh, but here's one more thing that Jesus says. There's something past the comma that we may miss and that I don't think we actually get all the way. And here's what he says, because he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. And so now I jump to these guys, like listening to Jesus listening to this parable, this thing that they can relate to. They, they know what a Pharisee is. They know what a tax collector is. And they're thinking about this story and they're thinking, okay, hold on. You're telling me that the tax collector, the guy who said, have mercy on me. I'm a cheat. I'm a sinner. Like I'm a ripoff artist. That's the guy who left all right with God. And, and the good guy, the guy who's good, he's moral, he's upright. He, he talks about his giving, his fasting and all that money stuff. He walks away not all right with God. I'm okay with the guy walking all, uh, all right with God, but this guy is not all right with God. I mean, that's kind of controversial, isn't it? Or is it? Or is it? Gang, here's the challenge. This is a challenge. This is why we are talking about this today. Jesus is telling this story because believe it or not, uh, believe it or not, Christians sometimes have a hard time accepting the idea that nobody's perfect. Did you know that? Christians have a very hard time accepting that concept, the idea that nobody's perfect. And Christians, Christians actually have too easy of a time sometimes looking at what they do as some sort of like merited grace in their lives. Like, here's, look at, look at this, God. Look, this is why you love me, God. Look, this is what I do. This is why you love me, God. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. I think this is what Jesus is getting at with us. And I know this. Here's why I know this, because I found myself there way more often than I would ever want to admit. I find myself there like the Pharisees. And Jesus helps us understand some things with this parable, with the challenges that we face through the Pharisee in this story. So here's what I wanna do for the rest of the time. I just wanna look at, at three observations with the Pharisee, not to condemn them. I don't wanna condemn them, but just to let Jesus help us see some traps, traps that get in the way that are actually barriers in our relationship with God of self-righteousness and, and, and looking at what really matters and looking at what we think matters versus what God says actually counts and matters in his kingdom. So let's look at that. What's the problem? What's the problem with the Pharisee? Why did he not get right, right? What did he do wrong? 
What did he do wrong, right? Why doesn't he get right with God? Because I don't, gang, listen to me. I don't want you to mistake this. Jesus was very clear. What he did did not get him right with God that day. It, so so he, he was not justified. He was not made right. What he did was detrimental to his relationship with God. It's not, and so here's what I want to say before we get is for you thinking about this through these, through these lenses, it's not just all oh, like be careful. It's watch out. Like this is dangerous. This is dangerous to the relationship that you have with your heavenly father. So first let's look at what he's pointing out. And then we're gonna look at each one of these uh, as something he did and then we're gonna look at our way out. So we're gonna see what he did, see our way out. So here's the first thing, first trap that comes. It said his prayer was actually more about him than God. And so these are easy to see, so I just wanna point them out. But that one's not too hard to see if you actually go back and read. And here's why it's not very hard to see. Like when you start to read, uh, what you'll come across a Pharisee saying is all you have to do is look at the word I. Right, so you read, what you'll see is you'll see him starting off by saying, God, thanks. And then he says, I, five times. So he's like, God, I, 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 you're welcome for me being so amazing, God. Like, aren't you so glad that you made me? Okay, that's kind of that's where he's at. And so, so with this, gang, listen, with this, Jesus gives us a key. He kind of gives us a key into our hearts and into uh, God. He's saying, listen, here's what, he, here's what he wants to get us to understand. Listen, the more that God, like the more you find yourself dwelling on God, and like thinking about God, the more you're gonna realize your place in the playing field and the actual playing field of God with him. And gang, here's the thing, the opposite is true too. The opposite is absolutely true as well. And this is what we see with the Pharisees. See, the less you focus on God, then the more you're gonna see that this life or the more you're gonna think that life is all about you. It's all about what you do and what you get and how dare they and I can't believe this and it's not fair and, and all that stuff and your rights and you deserve it. Like the, the more you focus on your life, that's what's gonna happen. Gang, I hope you know, here's what I hope you know. I hope you know that getting all that stuff and being in this perfect utopia world ain't gonna get you anywhere close to what you think you're gonna get. It's just not gonna get you there. It's never gonna make someone full of what God wants and full of joy that you think. Joy doesn't come from getting all that stuff. It just doesn't. And, and here's, because here's what I wanna say, you can get all of that and still miss life. You can get all that and still miss what life's all about. It's just never gonna come from that, okay? Honestly, and here's what I wanna say. Honestly, how often do we actually do it though? How often do we look at my rights, my stuff, what I need to get and I deserve and all that stuff. And it's like, man, if all that was lined up, then it would be great. No, it wouldn't. I'm just gonna tell you, no, it wouldn't, okay? It's not about what we deserve or what we should have because joy, here's what it comes from. Jesus is like, just look at me. Just look at what I did because joy comes from seeing Jesus and remembering, oh yeah. Oh yeah, man, like Jesus, like you never lost focus on God. You never made it about, about yourself, man. He was never self-absorbed. He was never about himself. He was never about what he deserved. Jesus was like, man, just from me, from me. And look, look how I live. That's where you're gonna receive the full measure of joy in your life. And, and the more that you focus on God, the more you make this about God, the more you're gonna realize, you're gonna realize that he loves you, that he made you, that he's for you, that he created everything around you. And then here, here's the thing, gang, when you do that, see that changes the field of play for you. That, that expands us because it's not about you. But here's what's so amazing. Because when you start to think about God, then it expands the playing field. Then you become a participant on the bigger field, the bigger thing that makes it. It's a way bigger picture than if you just focus on yourself. Listen, when you focus on yourself, the playing field's way smaller than if you focus on God. When you focus on God, that's the beauty of it. God actually brings in this amazing purpose You'll never find more than when you focus on God. And when you focus on yourself, it's gonna be so limited to what you can get. So here's my way out. Here's my way out, my way. I gotta remember that, man, I gotta make this about God. So I don't wanna make me a big deal. I'm gonna make him a big deal. That's the way out of it, okay? So let me ask you, I just wanna ask you a question here. So if you were to look at your life, look at not just your prayer life, but just look at your life every day, when you wake up, what you do, when you go to bed. Right now, if you're honest, here's what I wanna ask. What per, here you can just ask a me question. What percentage of my time and my efforts and my energy go towards God? Just every day, not just like on church on Sunday or something. What percentage of my effort and energy goes towards God or me, myself, and my family and I? Like what percentage is there? Jesus is saying, listen, the Pharisee, the Pharisee, he made a mistake. It's a trap looking at himself and saying that's where everything comes from. And, 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 he, and he, the other trap is that he knows he's nailing life. Now, how does he know he's nailing it? Well, it goes into the second trap, which is this, is that he focuses on the outside to determine that. That's the second trap that we actually get. So he just lists all the stuff that he does. Right, and he's like, "Let me. This is what I do, and this is." And, and so, and here's the catch, gang. It's so easy to do this. Like, it, it's so easy to get into that trap. It's so challenging. And if we don't see what's actually happening here, like, we will really fall victim to this ourselves because it's so easy to do. Like, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. 
That's what we got to catch. Like fasting and, and praying and tithing. All the, Jesus calls us to do every single bit of that. But here's our tendency, gang. Our tendencies are to let those things we do determine our standing with God and how we see other people. That's the tendency. So we let these things we do actually uh, get us, give us a feeling of being right with God and, and how we treat other people. Gang, and, and so, so here's what I want to ask here. Like what, what are you pointing to? Like, what are you looking at? What are you showing off to God to prove like you're standing with him to say, look, God, there we are. Look, that's why I'm okay. That's why I should be in your good graces. Man, do you see how he sees that stuff? I hope you do. I hope you see how he sees that stuff. So, so here's our way out of it. This is my way. See, because my way out is, is not looking at the outside, but saying here, what I do is actually points back to what, every time points back to what God has done for me. So what we do, what we do praying, fasting, tithing, helping, all good things, all good things. Like they, we should be to do, but what they are meant to do is they are meant to remind us. Every time we do these things, meant to remind us the sin that can still easily entangle us, even though we're redeemed, that it can still entangle us. And it's meant to remind us that, man, I want God, I want to put God at the center of my life and not me. And that's, that's why we do these practices. That's why we do what we call these spiritual disciplines. We do it because, man, I know I'm gonna put myself at the center of my life and that's never good. It, it decreases the playing field of my life and the purpose that I have. So I wanna put God at the center. And that's, so there, listen, there should always be a check into the why and not just the what. So, so again, I just wanna ask you like, When's the last time, when's the last time you actually just kind of take a pause from your religious activities and whatever you do to say, man, like, what's the heart behind this? Like, why am I actually doing this? Why, what's the heart behind this? And so that's so important to do. There's always, you get, the why is so much more important than the what. The Pharisee got it backwards. He looked at the what to say, look, that, that's what it is. But man, the why is always more important than the what. Here's the third trap that we fall into. It's that he compares himself to others. He compares himself to others. Hey, he says, listen, I love this. He, he goes, man, I'm so glad that I'm not like that tax collector, man. I'm so glad. Like, he is just the worst. And he like, I'm so much better. I'm so much smarter. He goes on and on, right? He's like, a terrible guy. And man, I'm just glad, God, that, that I'm not him. And, and, and so, gang, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We were never made to compare ourselves to others. We were never made for that purpose, to compare ourselves to other people. And yet, here's the thing, gang. It's one of the biggest pitfalls we make in our faith. It's one of the biggest pitfalls of our faith. Here's why it's so dangerous when we compare ourselves and our faith and our life to others. Three big things can actually happen. We end up, it's a trap, man, I'm telling you, when we actually compare ourselves to others. One thing that happens is I get full of myself because you don't measure up to me. That's what can happen. Like I get full of myself because you don't measure up to me. The second thing that happens is I get resentful because I don't measure up to you. That's the second thing that can actually happen. And here's the third thing that happens. Nobody wins. Like nobody wins when you compare yourselves to others. We have to understand, gang, listen, we have to understand the damage that happens. The damage that's done, not only just to yourself, but to other people when you do this, it's unbelievable uh, what the damage is. So here's what we do. Here's the, here's the way out. We gotta remember this. And I'm telling you, if you remember this, th this, this will get you out of it. Man, God doesn't grade on a curve. Listen, man, God will never, and, and will, he will never do this. He will never compare you to another person. So why should you? If God's not gonna compare you to somebody else, then why should you? So let me just ask you, I just wanna ask you a few questions in here just to think about this and, and see if you're, where you're at in this comparison trap game. Just a few questions. So one, do you find yourself being tired of trying to keep up with other people? Like, do you see yourself, like, are you doing certain things because you wanna do it or because there's something else driving you to do it? I think a lot of people are stuck in that spot. Are you strapped financially because you're trying to keep up or you want people to see a certain thing? And, but due to that, you're, being, you're so strapped, you're just out of financial uh, prospect that you can't even, like you got so much debt. Like that's a sign, that's a sign that, that you're in the comparison shop. Here's the worst one. This is the worst one. Like who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail? That just sounds bad, doesn't it? It's worth so many people do that. It's, it's ugly, man. You, you watch them, right? Or you, you get on their profile just to see the other shoe dropped so it makes you feel better about your life. Like, what is that? What is that? It, it's living life in the comparison trap. That's, that's what happens when you're stuck in this comparison trap. Gang, for those of us in Christ, we're just not called to do that. That's not who we're put on this earth to be, man. And you know who we're called to look at? We are called to look at one person, Christ we're called to look at Jesus. That's who we use as our gauge. And see, the thing is, like when we do that, when we compare ourselves to Jesus, you see, we realize that we are not perfect. And we also realize nobody is, nobody is. And that's gonna not only change how we see ourselves. Gang, listen to me. When you do that, it's gonna change how you see other people. That all of us need God's grace all the time, all the time, that we all need God's grace and mercy every day. I love this parable. 
I love it. I love it because it's not so much because it's like the most uplifting thing for me to look at, but I'm telling you, man, it's just such a reminder to me and my faith. And sometimes when I get so upside down in what my economy is and what God's economy is all about, and I think a lot about the people of Jesus' day who were listening to that story. That's why he gave the parable, not just for us, but for those who were listening, how upside down it had to have been for them to hear about the two guys in this story. And honestly, it didn't make sense to them. And here's what I'm gonna tell you, gang. I'm, right now, as I teach this, there are people who come to church, it still doesn't make sense to you. You still have it upside down. And I realize that as I teach in the middle of this and just went through the truths that Jesus wanted to reveal. Like there are people that still don't get this. You live your life so much more like one guy versus the other. And so I just wanna ask just to see if, if see about this. So, so here's what I want. This is why so many of us don't get it. Cause here, here, here we go. Like who in this story knew more scriptures? Pharisee or tax collector? Who went to church more? Who prayed more? Who had a better reputation in their community? Who, if you ask, man, who, who, which one of you loves God? Who would actually say me? That would be the Pharisee. That would be the Pharisee. And there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Like I want to be a church that teaches truth and teaches to do the right thing and, and to be morally upright and, and where we're learning about God and we pray and we do these all things, like we love people well and all that stuff. But here's my point, gang. This is my point. This is where so many of us don't get it. Like who do you think was more aware of their need for God? Like who do you think was more accurate with their position and their true standing with God? That'd be the tax collector. And more importantly for us to really think about our own lives and as a church, like who walks away right with God? That'd be the tax collector. And here's why this parable is so important for us as a church. This is why we're talking about it today. See, here's the temptation that we have as a church. And I'm telling you, it will be detrimental if we don't overcome this mentality and if we let this get to us and we don't recognize it and kill it ourselves. And it says, it's the failure to accept that nobody's perfect. We have the tendency to do that. We, will, we could fail to understand that and accept that nobody's perfect. And, and here's the thing, it's the, here's, here's what I wanna get at. This is what Jesus is trying to get. There should be a, never a time where anybody walks through this door and God willing, I'm praying that we get back soon where it's all, we're pumping on all cylinders and I'm praying that it gets back to soon. But there should be never anybody that walks through this door with this mentality, man, I got it all put together. Like I'm good, I'm, I'm good to go with you, God. There should never be that mentality, even us Christians, by the way should never be that. You do all these great things for God, we should never come into that. And the challenge, here's the challenge, gang, I'm telling you, the challenge is that the longer you're a part of a church, the more temptation there is to become like the Pharisee. And, and, and the, the less will be a place full, full of love, full of grace, a place where everybody's welcome to hear the good news of Jesus. We will become a barrier to the gospel if we think more like the Pharisee. And the tendency is to happen. It's, it's for that to happen. We will we'll become a barrier, not just for the gospel, for people to hear it for the first time, but for people to actually grow the right way in the gospel, the way that Jesus wants us to grow. That's why he's giving us this parable, man. I don't want to be a church that misses that. I don't want to be a church full of Pharisees. I know you don't either. I want to be a church that's full of people just saying, I, I, I'm not all the way there, but I know who is. I know Jesus is. I wanna be a church full of people who are honest with themselves and honest with God and humbly work on things because of God who gives them Jesus and grace and mercy and love. And yes, truth that we go after, that's who I wanna be. And, and, and gang, we need each other to help that. Like we can't be dividing ourselves into Pharisees, tax collectors, and them. And we can't do that. Like that's not who we gotta be. We, we need everybody to help us because I don't, want, I don't want anybody there. I don't know where you're at with God. Here's the truth. We're all kinds of places with God. That's the truth. Somebody's here, somebody's up there. Now, how do we work together? We all need each other's help to, because I don't want anybody to stay in the same place. I wanna just keep going, keep moving with Jesus. One of our core values here is that we never stop growing and we need each other to help get there with your walk with Jesus. I want it to move forward with each and every one of you every day of your lives. And even though, listen, even though we're here to grow, and, and to learn and, and, and grow our faith and work on things and move forward. Here's the thing, gang, you gotta get, some of that's gonna be messy. <laughs> like, our lives are a little messy and we got to have the grace to walk alongside instead of judging and keeping them down, man. We gotta keep walking with people like that. And that's okay that it's messy. Nobody's perfect, that's the thing. Nobody's perfect. So we extend grace like a hand up instead of judgment that actually just keeps them down, I'm telling you. And the more we can do that, I'm telling you, 
the, the, the church is gonna become the place that Jesus wants us to be, the more that we do that. We're gonna, I just wanna be full of people who are full of truth, full of grace, walking with people so that we can see Jesus not just like be this concept, but somebody who changes our lives and our marriages and our families and that we go after that together. And it is a little messy sometimes. And so we help each other constantly. And we remember like, man, I don't wanna be like the Pharisee. I, I don't, I wanna be somebody who just is full of love and understanding of my standing with God. It's so important, it's so important, and I'll be done, that we are a church that is just so full of grace and truth. I wanna be a place where that's extended to everybody because grace has been given to us. They never forget that, right? And this is, here's what I believe, the world is so hungry for God. Like I believe that. I believe every single person is so hungry from God. And, and here's the thing, we have the ability to show the world what God's love can do to a bunch of imperfect people. <laughs> it's not about us being perfect, it's about the perfect person changing us. And that changes everything, gang. It changes our position. It changes how we see ourselves, how we see people. And that's the kind of church I want to be. And I hope that's the kind of church you want to be too. Let me pray for us. God, man, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he didn't just come uh, to be the sacrifice for us, that he came to teach us these amazing truths and reveal some things in our hearts. God, thank you for this parable. Thank you for, for showing us. God, I, I pray that here's, here's what I'm praying for myself. I pray that I have the courage to face some of these traps with, with an open heart to actually come to you and just say, man, where am I missing this? Where am I in the trap? I don't wanna be in that trap. I don't wanna get out of that. And I wanna remember some things. So I pray for this church. I pray for our people. I pray for every man and woman and child who loves you to look at these and see these things and say, man, I wanna root those out, God. I wanna get those out of there. I want Jesus to just, man, affect me so much that I just, I just want to remember these things, get me out of those ruts. I don't wanna be self-righteous. I wanna be somebody who's full of grace and full of truth so that we can help each other grow. God, help us to find those things and then help us be the message carriers that you want us to be out there and in here as well. We love you. I pray that we can take this challenge wholeheartedly. We love you and we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us. I hope you have a great, great week. Have a good Sunday today, and we will see you here next time.